Hello friends, welcome back to the shop. Today is Sunday, May 15th. I got the month right this time. And it's a rainy overcast day here in southeastern Pennsylvania. We got what we got. So, I got a uh, shop pipe here. I think this is a Corona, I forget. Um, and I'm, I'm just smoking some haunted bookshop. I actually started it yesterday, just finishing it up today. Left it down here half packed uh, the reason I'm smoking this is I'm gonna switch over when in a few minutes and have the first smoke in uh, that Ligne Britannia pipe that I got from Trevor and Emily Talbert uh, so if, you might have seen that on Wednesday so I'm gonna have the first smoke I'm gonna talk a bit about breaking in pipes uh, but before I get to that I had a question from Paul Wozencraft, and Paul asked me, how do you open a Zippo with one hand? Thus the title of this video. Um, and you know, it's funny, I don't, I didn't know how to answer that question uh, at first. I had to think about it a lot because it's just something that I do automatically. I've been doing this for so long that I don't really think about it. So I'm going to try to explain it. And I was going to give a snarky answer, which is you open them for 30 years and eventually it just happens, <laughs> which is how I, I figured it out. Um, I don't remember struggling to open a Zippo with one hand, but I suppose there was a learning curve there, but it's been so long. Uh, I just don't know. But Paul was interested in this because he likes to walk his dog and smoke a pipe. And he said, you know, between holding the leash and the pipe and the, it, it's just a, a nightmare to do that with two hands. Well, I'll, I'll explain it and I'll give you a few safety tips along the way, just based on stupid things I've done in the past. So I think the way you hold it is important. So I always hold the, the lighter like this. And this is going to be a little bit hard for me to do because I'm not used to turning this way when I open it. So these two fingers are right below the hinge. So this finger here is actually touching the hinge and the other one is, is right below that finger. The, the, the pinky doesn't really do anything. You can put it below, I guess. I, I don't really think I do that. And then uh, this is the part that's going to be really hard to explain. So I, I hold it so that it's kind of caught in the palm of my hand, this corner. So this, this lower corner is getting caught right in the palm, like just, oops, just, sorry, just below the, um, uh, crotch of these two fingers it's like right in that area and when you do that you get a pretty stable uh, base and then you just take your thumb and flick it I'll try to do that facing you Oops. it's very hard to do in this orientation Here. now if you're holding it like that and you're holding the pipe as you normally would it's really quite easy to do that. And then your thumb's positioned to hit the striker and you're all set. Okay. So that's how you open it. And Paul, you just got to play with it. I, I'm sorry I can't really give you more than that. But I think the two key things are where those two fingers are placed and where this corner is touching my hand and sort of getting stuck in the palm of my hand. Um, once it's open, you can light it easily with your thumb and then you know you can obviously light your pipe but notice where my index finger is I've learned the hard way to be very careful about where that finger lands because as you turn this the flame is going to come up under that finger and you will burn it. Um, I've burned it many times <laughs> so I will usually light and then try to like put it back there or something if I remember um, or I kind of shift it up in my hands and hold it like this. So that that finger is not flying out over top of the flame. So that's the one caveat to doing it this way is you might burn your next finger if you're not careful. Closing it is another story altogether. So once it's lit, you know, you, you got to close it and you can do it. You know, you can try to swing it around and get it with your index finger and that works what I often wind up doing is I'll just hit it on like my leg or something like that um, 
that obviously is not the safest thing to do because it's lit as you're coming down. Uh, I have had the very unpleasant experience of driving and trying to do that and let the lighter slipping and landing in the uh, passenger footwell. Thankfully, I didn't have a passenger because they probably would have been quite mad at me. Um, and there's nothing worse than driving and realizing you've got a lit Zippo lighter laying on the floor of your car. <laughs> Everything was fine. I pulled it over. I, I took care of it. But. So that's a little risky. Um, but, you know, you, you got to practice these things. And walking a dog is a great time to practice it because if you drop the lighter, it's you know, no harm done. Um, are there other ways to do it? You know, there's and I, I this is very unreliable for me, but you can just give it a, a, a snap. So there we go. And that'll work. Make sure you're holding it very firmly. And there are folks that can close it that way. I've never been very good at that. Um, but yeah, that's that's how I do it. So, Paul, I hope that was helpful. Uh, sorry, there's just no good way to do that unless I had an overhead camera and I didn't want to set that up. So this pipe is done, I think. I'll give it one more shot. You notice where that finger wound up. Yeah, I got a little bit left. Okay, so the pipe I'm going to be uh, packing in just a moment is this little beauty. This is from uh, Talbert Pipes. It is from the Linier Britannia line. I think I'm pronouncing that right. And these are pipes where, I th I, as I explained on Wednesday, that the stumbles were from uh, an old French factory that uh, Trevor and Emily uh, purchased when they lived in France and uh, brought back with them when they moved back to the US. So these were uh, pre-drilled, partly shaped, and uh, they do the final shaping, the rustication, the stem work, and everything. So you're basically getting an artisan pipe at a very reasonable price. Uh, you know, these are comparable to something like a Savinelli. So uh, really a wonderful, wonderful uh, opportunity to own something handmade uh, by some very talented uh, pipe makers. Uh, Trevor pointed out on my video on Wednesday that Emily does all the rustication, his wife does all this rustication, and it is beautiful. And I, I wish I had ways to explain how good this feels in my hand. You know, it's so tactile and it, it, it's like having a really good grip on something. Uh, not that you need a really good grip on your bike, but it's just nice to feel that. Uh, it bites into your hand a little bit when you close your hand around it. Uh, really wonderful. So I'm going to load this pipe up with some Haunted Bookshop and uh, give it its first smoke. And while I do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about breaking in pipes. Um, so the first thing is, uh, you, you know, obviously uh, I, I fully trust uh, Trevor and Emily in, in terms of their, their pipe making and all that. But sometimes you get like fluff in here from a pipe cleaner or something. So the first thing I always do is blow it out. And there's absolutely nothing in there, which is exactly what you want. The airway is clean and clear. Um, this pipe does have a bowl coating. I don't have a problem with bowl coatings. Some people do. Um, you know, you, you might be able to request that a maker not put a bowl coating on. A lot of them are water soluble, so you can wipe them out. Um, so those that aren't, you can always sand them out. But I, I've never had a problem with them. And even if you do get a taste from them, like sometimes the folks that use honey, you get a little bit of a, a sweetness off of that. It goes away in a couple of smokes. It's not a big deal. And it, it does help build cake. And that's the reason why uh, carvers use it. Uh, it it's, it's something that really makes it kind of idiot proof in terms of breaking in your pipe. So if you're new to pipe smoking and you haven't broken in a lot of pipes, bulk coating is really your friend. Um, I'm going to use Haunted Bookshop because I know Haunted Bookshop. I know how it smokes. I know. I, I know I can finish the bowl, which is important, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, I, I And I like to have, at least for the first maybe five or six pipe uh, bowls full, I like to use the same tobacco, just so that I'm kind of learning the pipe and, and getting to know it. And I like using something that I know well. So packing, I pack the first bowl. I've got my tub of one to bookshop here. There we go. 
I pack the first bowl much more carefully than uh, subsequent bowls. And normally I'm just kind of a stuff and puff guy. But if it's the first time I'm smoking this pipe, I use the three-step method. So I'm taking, sorry you can't see it, but I'm taking three, you know, hefty pinches of tobacco and going uh, lightly packing, a little bit more moderately packing, and then packing firmly with a third pinch. Uh, I was taught that this is, and, and I know it's politically incorrect, but this is how I was taught. You pack like a child, you pack like a woman, and then you pack like a man. It's stuck in my head. That's, that's the way I think about it. Okay, so I've got the pipe packed now using the, the three-step method. You'll notice it's not filled to the very top um, because I don't want it, as, as you light it, the tobacco expands, and I don't want it expanding all over the top. And I will now light it and talk a little bit about uh, the break-in process. And first light and tamp. The draw on this is just perfect. Very good. So, why was I so careful about packing this bowl? Why didn't I just stuff and puff like I normally do? Well, you've heard the, um, I'm sure you've heard this, um, the, the advice for breaking in a pipe where the first thing you do is you pack it one third of the way and you smoke that to the bottom. And then for the next bowl, you pack it two thirds and you smoke that to the bottom. And then for the next bowl, you pack it fully and smoke it to the bottom. The reason that advice is given I'm trying not to, let, not to let this go out. That advice guarantees that you're going to smoke to the bottom each time. And if you're new to pipe smoking and you're, you have difficulty getting through a full bowl, you know, some folks don't like the taste at the bottom, that, those kind of things, by all means do that. It's a great way to break in a pipe. For me, I usually smoke straight to the bottom, and this is how I've been breaking in my pipes for a long time. <laughs> I stopped counting because it makes me feel old. So. Why is there a break-in process? Why, why do you need to even think about this? Well, there's two things that you're doing. The first thing is very important. You're building cake, and you need that cake on your pipe, on, on the inside of your pipe bowl, because it's going to protect the briar from burning. Uh, briar is very fire resistant, um, incredibly fire resistant actually, but it does burn. And if this was a bare bowl, you know, no bowl coating, what would be happening right now is the tobacco would be burning and some of the briar would be burning with it. And the walls become carbonized and carbon from the tobacco actually bonds to the wall of the pipe. That's what's giving you the cake. And that provides a protective barrier for the next time you smoke it, where you're not burning briar anymore, you're just bonding more carbon to, to the carbon that's there. And that'll just continue. And of course you have to ream the pipe after usually a very long time, but you have to ream it. But that's why you want to ream carefully, because you never want to get rid of that cake, otherwise you're back to breaking in the pipe. And what that does for you is it, it, it 
protects you from burnout. Um, you know, you, prior to being a natural material, you don't know what's behind that surface that you see. And anywhere where you get a little bit of a burning starting, it might seed further burning. There might be a pit behind it or something that allows that burning to accelerate. And before you know it, you're, you're, you've burned through the bowl of the pipe. The other reason to break in a pipe, and this is one that I think is underappreciated, is that it gives you the opportunity to get to know the pipe. So I'm not one of these don't smoke a pipe more than once a day, guys. I'm not one of these you got to let the pipe rest for seven days. I will probably smoke this pipe several times today. I will probably smoke this pipe several times this week because I want to get to know it. Um, and that's important. Pipes have personality. And of course you have personality and, and, and it's a meeting of those two things, the, how the pipe is smoking, how the briar is behaving, how you draw what your cadence is, um, how you pack it. All those things have to kind of meld together for it to be a good smoking experience. And I talked about this probably last year um, when we were discussing uh, corn cobs versus high-end pipes and all that nonsense. Um, the fact that there is no such thing as a good smoking pipe. The pipe doesn't smoke. It's a tool. You can make any pipe smoke well. Uh, I mean, there's probably some abominations that won't. But for the most part, if the pipe is well engineered, and you can adjust to it, it's going to, to, you're going to have a good smoking experience. I almost said it's going to smoke well. The pipe doesn't smoke. <laughs> but that phrase, it's a good smoking pipe, is just so embedded in our culture that it's, it's hard to not use it. And I, I catch myself saying it a lot. So the break-in process gives you that opportunity to really understand the pipe. You know, so far, sorry, the, having that smoke problem again. I'm going to put another. I'm going to put an air filter right up above, and hopefully the noise from that won't be too terrible. But it'll hopefully help with some of the smokiness in my videos. Yeah, so getting to know your pipe is really important. And that's one of the reasons, um, you know, if I have more than one pipe that's new, I will not smoke the second one until I'm thoroughly familiar with the first one. And then the first one goes into my rotation and I can start breaking in the second one. I want the pipe broken in and I want to understand it before I move on to another new pipe. That's why I worry about, you know, when I see people buying, you know, two, three pipes at a time or every week they've got a new pipe. You're really not giving those pipes a chance to perform for you, to perform for you. I did it again. You're not, you're not giving yourself a chance to get the best out of those pipes because you need to spend time with them. And there's this thought, statement, that uh, you have to smoke a pipe between 70 and 100 times before it's really broken in and something magical happens. I, I don't know if it's magical, it's probably physics and chemistry, but something happens after that somewhere between 70 and 100 smoke where the pipe just seems to come alive for you. And that's probably partly you and partly the pipe, for sure. I 
and I know guys that are, you know, realizing that now that have very large collections and they're thinking, yeah, how am I ever going to get that done? How am I ever going to smoke a pipe a hundred times if I've got 300 of them? I've become a very limited pipe buyer now. I used to buy probably six or so a year. Well, the sun's coming out. That's pleasant. Uh, yeah, six or so a year, but now I'm down to one or two a year. And I'm going to stick to that because it, I have more than I need now. Of course, it's not a matter of what you need. It's a matter of what you want. But I have plenty of pipes, and I only want to buy things that I really want. And I want to have the time to enjoy those and, and break them in. I like this. I like the look of it. I mean, it's just it's just downright beautiful, and uh, I'm enjoying the smoking. All right, so hope that was informative, and uh, maybe you picked up a thing or two. Maybe you have a different opinion. If you do, make a video. It, it's there's no rules. You know, it's, if if you're enjoying yourself, you're doing it right. But if you have a better way to do it or a different way to do it, make a video, leave a comment. Maybe I'll learn something. You can teach an old dog a new trick. So in shop news, we're getting there. Um, I started to move things back where they belong last night. Oh, last night. Yesterday afternoon. Spent some time yesterday morning and early afternoon cleaning uh, the, the, the the cushion pads that I have down on the concrete. I was going to throw them away. They're not very expensive. I get them from Harbor Freight, and, and they're just great for like standing at the lathe. Um, I was going to throw them away because they're spongy, but it turns out they're closed cell foam so they don't really absorb um they're actually floating <laughs> when i came down here in, in, in last sunday uh they don't really absorb they just you know had water stains on them and stuff so i i got some lysol and i scrubbed them off and then wiped them down and stood them up to dry and they're all dry and looking pretty good now so i can start moving things placing those again i'm ready to get back to work on my um my rack for the rubbermaid tubs and that's all dried out nicely uh the wood is still a little damp compared to where it should be but it's it's dry enough it's not going to warp at this point and i actually hung the, the the shelf that i had made i hung it up it's not a shelf it's actually it looks like a ladder so it's a rectangular uh rectangle <laughs> with cross pieces in it that'll be the bottom or middle shelf and the Rubbermaid tubs will sit on, on that, sit on the cross pieces. So that, I was afraid that it was going to twist as it dried. So I hung it and I rotated it every day and uh, it seems to have dried out nicely and it's pretty flat so I'm happy about that. Yeah, the wood was construction grade fur. It was wet to begin with. I wasn't expecting furniture quality from this. I just need something to put the darn Rubbermaid tubs in. So. so we'll get back to that maybe today. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do today. Now that the sun is shining, maybe I'll go out and do a little bit of yard work. We still haven't gotten our vegetables in. Uh, just the weather's been lousy. So maybe we'll... Maybe I'll find some time during the week that I can uh, 
sneak off during the day and, and pick up some plants. One of the places that we like to go is, uh, it's actually an, uh, I think it's Amish. Might be Mennonite. It's one of those, but they are closed on Sundays. So uh, I, I can't go today. All right. Well, with that, I think I wasted enough of your Sunday. Certainly haven't wasted enough of mine. This is a, this is a good experience. And I got that I, I'm enjoying this so much I forgot that I had coffee. All right. So let's wrap up. Thank you for taking the time. I hope you found the video informative. Likes are always appreciated. Comments are always appreciated. So please uh, take the time. I really would uh, like that. And uh, we'll be back on uh, maybe Wednesday. Maybe. And uh, I'll definitely be back Friday night for the live stream. So take care. And until we speak again, I look forward to talking all again very soon. Goodbye now.